Well, good morning. Good morning. It is an honor to be with you today. I, uh, I know your pastor and have watched as this church has uh, grown and extended its ministry um, here in this community, but also to the ends of the earth. And I, I just rejoice in what God is doing here. And I appreciate the worship this morning, didn't you? Boy, there's something about it. Um, I drove two hours to get to worship today, and I enjoyed every moment of it. So I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. Some time ago, in my quiet time, I studied the prayers of Paul, and uh, I was absolutely amazed at what I found. And what I discovered was that my prayer life doesn't look a whole lot like Paul's. And I learned that there were a lot of things that I never gave thought to that I needed in my life, and I needed to pray for those who are near to me, my family, uh, my friends, my fellow church members, and fellow ministers of the gospel. And so today, I want to talk to you about Uh, from one of those prayers, and I hope that God will instruct you. And here's what I want to try to do. I want to communicate with you today. I want to challenge you to take a step up in your prayer life, Uh, to move from what I would consider to be very earthy things to praying on a level that makes impact from the inside out, because that's what Paul prays for. And you can study all of his prayers, and you will find it to be exactly the same. So, Ephesians chapter 3, one of the great prayers of the Apostle Paul for the Ephesian church. Let's begin in verse 14. He says, For this reason I kneel or I bow before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend or to grasp with all the saints what is the length, width, height, and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, and all of God's people said, amen. I'm sure you've had this experience before. You go through a a drive-in at a fast food place, and you make your order, and it orders something like this. Well, I would like a uh, cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. And the very next line that the attendant says to you is not, that'll be so much, but they always, they always say it like this, do you want to supersize it? I want you to think a minute about what that means. What they're really saying is, do you want more grease in your system? Do you want more cholesterol in your life so that you can make yourself speed toward a time when you can have a heart attack and a stroke or something like that? In fact, my wife went through one recently, and here's what they said. Uh, the little attendant said, uh, she said, I would like, and when she pulled up to the window, I'd, could I change my order? I really don't want the curly fries. I'd really like the regular fries. And he said, oh, ma'am, you're in luck. We just got them out of the grease. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't make me very excited about eating them. Well, today I want to talk to you about supersizing your prayers. In fact, I want to take the words of the Apostle Paul and lay them at your feet and into your heart and ask God to do a work in you because what Paul prays for the church at Ephesus is that they may have their spiritual eyes supersized. Listen to how he talks about it. He says, I'm praying that you may know the power of God in your life, that you may know the presence of God in your life, that the love of God may overflow your life and that his fullness may become rich and complete in your life. 
That's a different kind of praying than I think most of us do. We're usually praying, Lord, could you uh, help me get to the end of the month? And could you help me with my car payment? And could you, Lord, could you do this and you could do that? But Paul prays for spiritual transformation in the heart and lives of the Ephesian church. And you think about if you're praying for your family, if you're praying for your friends, for your children, praying that God would supersize their spiritual life. That's a much different thing. And oh my, how needed it is in our lives today. So I want us to look at his, at his prayer. He says in the beginning, for this reason, pointing back to all the verses that have preceded, it's sort of like a therefore in Scripture. It's there for a reason, right? And it's pointing back to what he has already said. For this reason, he said, I bow my knee before the Father. Now, We don't always bow whenever we pray. Sometimes we stand, sometimes we lift our hands. But Paul is simply emphasizing that when he prays, he goes before the Father and he goes before him with humility. I come to think that whenever we recognize we're in the presence of Almighty God, I mean the sovereign God of the universe, the Father of heaven and earth, it ought to sort of make us stand back and think, maybe I need to be humble when I come into his presence. So Paul says, I humble myself before the Father. Now I realize there's some people in this room that the word Father is a hard word because your father may not, may not have been a godly person or your father may have been abusive or your father may have been someone who did not treat you well or walked off and left your family. I, I hope that is not true of any of you, but I know when I preach to a crowd that that is often the case. But I want you to know in Scripture, when it talks about the Father, it's talking about our Father to whom we pray, our Father who is this magnificent, wonderful one who cares for us at every point along the line in our lives. Father is a beautiful term in Scripture. You agree with that? So Paul says, I'll tell you who I'm praying to. I'm talking to my father. Let me go back in Scripture in these verses in in chapters 1 and 2, and I want to point some things out to you about the father. First of all, what you need to understand is that we serve, we come before when we pray, a good father. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means that your heavenly father wants nothing but what is good for you and for his glory. What he wants is what is the best in your life. He won't give you what is not good for you, but he'll pour out on you every good thing in your life. He wants you to understand when you talk to him in prayer, you're talking to a good father who has wonderful good things he wants to do in your life. In fact, you know what the scripture says in James? It says that every good and perfect gift that comes down from above comes from our father. So when you pray, listen, you're talking to a good father. But he says another thing in chapters 1 and 2. Whenever you pray, you're talking to a father who is gracious, a gracious father. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when you go back in Scripture, here's what you will discover. Everything that comes to us comes to us on the basis of God's grace. And aren't you glad? Listen, if I had to be good enough for God to save me, I'd be in big-time trouble. How about you? If I had to be good enough for God to say, well, I think I'll bless that person, I'd be in trouble. I don't deserve his blessings, and you don't either. But here's what you discover. (laughs) In fact, you go back to chapter 1, and and he talks about how God blesses us. He, He has chosen us. He has adopted us. He has given us in all of this in him who is the beloved. He has redeemed us and forgiven us. And he says it all comes, in verse 7, out of the riches of his grace, which he has richly poured out on us. Here's what he's saying. Some translations have it like this, that God has lavished us with his grace. Listen, when you come to God in prayer, it's wonderful that in the book of Hebrews it says you're coming before a throne of grace. And it says, because of that, you and I can come boldly before the throne of grace. We can come confidently before the throne of grace. And here's what that means. It means that I know that when I speak to the Father, that my Father is a gracious Father, and everything He does in my life, He does on the basis of grace, including hearing my prayer. 
It's the only reason he wants to hear me, because, because of his grace extended in my life. Listen, I, I sometimes get the idea that some people think that God's grace is not big enough for them. Let me just tell you something. God's grace is sufficient in every need that you have in your life. There is nothing that God's grace is not big enough to cover, including the blackness of your heart and the darkness of your sin. You need to understand, if you want to be saved today, the only way to come to Christ is on the basis of God's grace. I want to relax some of it. Some of you are thinking, well, you know, I'd really like to know God better, but I just can't get good enough to know him. No, no, you just need to go ahead and admit your, you, just go ahead and admit you'll never get there on that way. The only way to know God is on the basis of his grace when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He will save you, and he will save you completely because he is a gracious father. Well, one other thing about this father we pray to. When you pray to him, you need to understand he is a generous father. Listen, I, I, I get really upset. It, 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 it just sort of ticks me off. When I hear Christian people talking about God as if he is somehow chintzy, as if he, he holds all of these wonderful blessings and he keeps them back to himself. No, no, listen. In, in the very first chapter of this incredible book of the Bible, he says that God has blessed us, listen to this, with every... Did, did you hear that word? I don't know. I, I've studied it in the Greek. And you know what it means in the Greek? Every, okay? He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. That means that no matter what you need in your life, he is capable, able, more than that, he desires to give it to you. You say, well, I've talked to God and he didn't give me what I wanted. You know why? Because he doesn't want you to, he doesn't want you to bust your nose. He doesn't want you to fall down because there are some things if he gave it to us, it would destroy us. But this generous, gracious, loving, good Father only gives us what is good for us. But I'm going to tell you, when he does, he pours it out, and he pours it out, and he opens the windows of heaven, and he keeps pouring it out. He is a generous Father, good, gracious, generous Father. That's the God to whom you and I pray. Now, I know about you, but that, that kind of makes me want to pooch my chest out and say, I'm going to go talk to my daddy. Because I'm telling you, he's ready to hear me, and he cares about me. He wants to know what's on my mind and on my heart. And better than that, he's going to take care of all the needs of my life according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's his promise. So if you hadn't been praying, that'll make you want to pray. But Paul just says, I, I kneel before this father, but he says, there's, there's something else I want you to understand. When you come before him, you need to you need to supersize your prayers because you're talking to a supersized God, all right? We're not talking to some little wimpy God who can't meet our needs. We're talking to a, a powerful, awesome, sovereign God of the universe. So he says when you pray, make all of your needs known to him. But Paul gives us some very specific things for which he prays. And I want to tell you, if you'll pray this for your kids, it'll make a world of difference. For your spouse, it'll make an incredible difference. If you'll pray this for your pastor and your staff, oh my, what a difference it will make. So here are, the, here are the petitions that he makes. First of all, he says this. Look what he says. He says, I'm going to pray in this way. For when I pray, I pray that you will be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. I want you to just think about this for a moment. You understand the Christian life is lived from the inside out, right? Not lived from the outside in. What happens inside us determines what happens outside of us. What, what God does as a work in our heart transforms into the work of our mind, into the work of our will, into the work of everything we do. So he says, here's what I'm praying. I'm praying that in your inner person, that is in your heart of hearts, in your life of life, in the inner core, in your spirit, he said, I'm praying you may know the power of the Holy Spirit so that when you stand in this wicked, 
mean, awful world that we live in, you will stand in the strength of his power and his might and not on your own. I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you, I face stuff every day I could not face on my own if I didn't have God's power in me. How do you face a crazy world that we live in? The pressures and the stresses of this world. I'll tell you how. You do it by standing in the power of his might. In fact, you know what he says about this? He says this power is from the Spirit. You know, I'm an old dude, and you can already tell by looking, so I'm just going to fess up and I'm going to act like it. We used to sing an old song a long time ago. Lord, send the power, the Pentecostal power. That makes some Baptists nervous. I'm not going to let Pentecostal steal my Pentecostal power that came down on the day of Pentecost. Amen? The moment I trusted Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit came to live in me. The person of the Holy Spirit came to live in me. And I have the same power as came down on the day of Pentecost. I have the Pentecostal power, and so do you if you're a child of God. He said, when you pray, pray that that Pentecostal power is unleashed in our lives. He said, when you pray, you need to pray in such a way that you allow what he calls in chapter 1 and verse 19, the immeasurable power of the Spirit. You know, we go through our Christian life just kind of, oh, Lord, I just I need help to get through tomorrow. Listen, do you understand that the mighty, holy, all-powerful, Almighty God lives in you. It lives, He lives in your heart. Do you understand that what Paul is praying? I'm praying for these Ephesian Christians that they will let the immeasurable power of God explode in them so that they might be able to live in the midst of all of the conflicts of the world with the power of God's Holy Spirit so they can face anything because they face it in His power. In fact, you know how he describes this power in chapter 1, verse 21? He says, the same power that brought Jesus Christ out of the grave on the third day is the same power that lives in you. Wow. That means that whenever I come up against temptation... I don't have to succumb to temptation. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit living in me. In fact, I like what Martin Luther said. He said, whenever temptation comes, knocks at my door, he said, I just send, I just send Jesus to the door. That's the best way to answer temptation in your life. You have the Holy Spirit. You don't have to succumb when sin comes knocking at your heart's door. You can say no to sin. Whenever you come in and go through a storm in your life and you feel like your life is, is turning in turmoil and you don't know where to turn or what to do, whenever the, the thunder clouds are roaring and the, and the hurricane winds and the tornadic winds are coming against you, he says, stand in the power of his might because in his power you can stand against the storms of life. Hmm. And whenever you serve him, don't serve him in your strength. Serving in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he says, I'm praying for the church at Ephesus. I'm praying that my Christian friends will know the power, the might of the Holy Spirit inside them. I'm praying that for you today. And by the way, you need to pray it for your Christian friends and your children. A second petition is this. Listen to it. He says, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You say, no, wait a minute. I thought he was writing to the church. Why is he saying they need to get saved? He's not talking about being saved. He says, I'm praying that Christ may dwell in you. It's not a visitation. It's a permanent residence in you. That's what he's talking about. In fact, maybe I can illustrate it like this. Uh, In my, uh, the last 30 years, I've been in a different church every Sunday, and some of you are saying, I'm hearing you preach, and now I know one sermon's enough, okay? Uh, So I understand that. But oftentimes, I will go to a church, and I would be preaching, and then uh, there would be some kind of conference at night, an associational conference, and I'd be doing, so I I would stay in somebody's home in the afternoon. They would invite me to their house. And I will tell you, 
Oklahoma Baptists are wonderful people, and every time I went to somebody's house, they would always say these words, come on in, and you know the nest of the line, right? Make yourself at home. In fact, they would usually say, why don't you come and um, listen, the refrigerator's got some uh, soft drinks in it if you would like some, and uh, make yourself at home, just go get it. And, and by the way, there's a bedroom back there and a bed. If you want to take a nap, you go back and make yourself at home. Now, that is a kind and generous act to say, I want you to be comfortable in my house. That's wonderful. But here's what they weren't saying. I want you to come and stay forever and ever and ever. Amen. I don't want you to move in. And they, when they say make yourself at home, they weren't saying, oh, by the way, go through my closets and the drawers. And by the way, make yourself at home and, and uh, look at my checkbook. Whatever you want to do, just make yourself at home. At my house, if you'd come and I'd say, make yourself at home, why don't you get a broom and sweep the... No, never mind. Okay, that's not what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about a visit. He says, I'm praying that you may let Christ dwell in your hearts. That word dwell means to take up permanent residence. He's saying, I want Christ not to just visit. I want him to have full control of every part of your life. Maybe I can illustrate it like this. How many of you have ever seen the show Fix Your Upper? Go ahead and admit it. Have you seen it, Fix Your Upper? Chip and Joanna. Oh, my. You know, they love to hate somebody, and they'll take somebody, and they'll show them houses, and they will buy absolutely the worst house on the block. I've seen them, I've seen them buy houses that were horrible. I mean, nearly falling down, and they go in, and the first thing they do is that Joanna says, here's what I want to know. I want to know what are the things you like, what are the things you want, because here's what she does. She wants, when they walk in, after they have redone this house, they want them to walk in and say, oh, this is my home. I feel like this is where I belong, right? That's what she wants. But before they do that, Chip gets his day. What's his day? Demo day. I like demo day. I'd like to be a part of that. He goes in. He runs through walls. He, he takes sledgehammers to cabinets. He tears everything down. And I'm telling you, they take it back to the studs most of the time, and they clear it out, and they clear out walls. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and you just look at that, and you go, how can they ever? And then, and then they showcase what they have done, and it's unbelievable. Transformation like you have never seen. You say, what does that have to do with Christ being at home in us? Here's what it means. Last I checked, the Scripture says that whenever we come to Christ, the old is taken away, and behold, all things become new, right? When Christ come to dwell in us, here's what He wants. He wants to have full sway. He wants to clean out all the junk in our heart and in our lives, and He wants to fill up every crook and cranny. No closet is held back from Him. No place in our heart that He cannot go or cannot have full sway. He doesn't want to just come sit in your house. He wants to be the master of our house. He wants to be the ruler. He wants to take care of our mind, our heart, and our soul. He wants to dictate our direction and our agenda. He wants to tell us how we live and to live right. He will only guide us to go in the ways that are blessings to us and glory and worthy of honor to Him. So when he says, I want you to let Christ dwell in your hearts by faith, he's saying, by faith, you let Christ take every part of your life and rule it. Well, that'd make a difference in your life, wouldn't it? You know, when I get in trouble, it's when I push Christ off the throne of my heart and I decide I want to live and be in charge of it on my own. But when Christ is sitting on the throne of your heart and he's at home, I mean, he's at home. This is, your heart is now his home. Oh my, what a difference it makes. And then he prays this. He said, I pray that because you're rooted and grounded in love, that you will know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. Now, could I just tell you something? If I'd have been, when I, when I first read this, I was taken back. It may not, may not mean anything to you, but I think it will. 
I was taken back about what I read. Because here's what he's saying. I would have thought that Paul would have said, here's my prayer for you, Ephesians. I'm praying that you may love God more every day than you love him today. Now, now that would be a good prayer, wouldn't you think? I need to love God more every day of my life. I'm, I hate to say it, I'm 75 years old. I love him more today than I did when I was a nine-year-old when I came to Christ. But I'll tell you this, I still need to love my Lord more. I want him to have more of me, and I want to love more of him. That's not what Paul prayed for. He said, I pray that you will be able to grasp or comprehend what is God's love for you. D.A. Carson, who is a great New Testament scholar, tells a story about uh, one of his fellow professors and his wife, Perry and Sandy. Perry and Sandy were a young couple who had no children, and, but they decided that what they would do is that they would take in foster children, babies, foster babies. They would pick them up at the hospital and hold them until the time that they were adopted. Now, both of my children are adopted. I know what that's like. I give thanks to God every day for that, that first uh, lady who took care of our son for three months before we were able to complete the adoption she was the first one to love him and to, to serve him and to meet his needs. And I thank God that she did a wonderful job. And then our daughter was three weeks in a home, in a foster home. And I'm so thankful for that, that family that just wrapped their arms around her and loved her. And when they handed it over to us, she was, a, she was a wonderful, beautiful girl that God had prepared. And they had taken such wonderful care of her. But one day, the DHS of their state came to them and said, we want, you to, we want you to take care of twin boys who are 18 months old. And they said, oh, no, 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 we, we only take care of newborn, newborns. And they said, well, but we need you to pray about this. And so they prayed about it. And they decided they would take those boys in. And so they took them in. And the very first night, Perry tells the story that he took them and he put them in their room and in their beds and he tucked them in and he got them all he thought was so comfortable and loved on them and, and told them he'd just be around in the other room. And he said, I waited about 30, 40 minutes and I went back in and he said, their little pillows were wet with tears, but they had never made a sound. He said, the only thing we could figure out is that they had gotten into big trouble whenever they cried in some of the other places that they had been. They had been, by the way, listen to this, in nine foster homes in 18 months. And he said, that's all we could figure out. He said they were failing to thrive emotionally and physically and in every way, intellectually. And he said, so we had those little boys for two years. And he said... When they left our home at four and a half months old, he said it was the most amazing thing. They were thriving in every way possible. You know what made the difference? Love. Love. Think about yourself. When you feel loved, you feel secure, right? When you feel loved... You feel like life is worth living. You flourish. Here's what Paul is saying. I'm praying for you Christians to somehow be able to grasp and understand how much God loves you. Because when you do, you will flourish. You will grow and you will mature. You will You'll become a person who thrives intellectually and spiritually and emotionally. Can you imagine how important this is for us to pray this for our children and for our teenagers? That they might be able to grasp how much God loves them so that they'll never have to go find love in the wrong place. So that they'll always have somebody knowing in the back of their heart and mind that there is a God in heaven, the Father who loves them, who will not let them fall, who cares about them, who is in every part of their life, who will meet all of their needs. Don't you know how wonderful it is and how secure and confident we become when we understand the depths and the heights and the widths of God's love? You know what? God's love is wide enough. It expands around the world. 
to the darkest places in this world. Do you understand that God's love is deep enough? It goes to the deepest center, mucked in the, in the muck mire of sin. It reaches down and touches them. Do you understand that God's love is so wonderful and magnificent that it never fails us? Do you know that it is long enough that it reaches all the way to eternity? Do you understand God's love is so magnificent that He loves you before you love Him, and He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross? while you were still a sinner so that you might understand the depths of God's love for you. He says, pray that. I pray that for you Christians, that you can grasp that. And lastly, he prays that you may know the fullness of God in your life. <laughs> Here's what he's saying. Just wrap it all in a bow. He's saying, I, I want you to know what it is like to be so full of God in your life that he meets everything that you need, that you need nothing but him. Paul concludes like this. He says, when you pray, understand this, you're talking to a father who is able. Isn't that a good word? He is able, capable. He has all the ability to do what you ask him to do, better than that, far more, super abundantly more, supersized more than what you can pray or ask or think. He said, when you talk to him, he is able to meet all of your needs. When you talk to him, he will meet the needs of your children and your grandchildren. When you pray these spiritual prayers for them, he will step down into their life and he will do things that they can't even imagine will accomplish. God wants to do all of this because he is good and he is gracious and he is generous. That's the God you and I serve. And that's the Father to whom we pray. So the question is, Will you rise above praying for, for the end of the month and start praying for God to do a work in your family and your spouse and your children and your grandchildren and fellow church members that is supernatural, spiritual in their life that will transform them so they become new creatures in Christ? And if you've never come to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, would you let this wonderful Father wrap his arms around you today and let his love flow in and over you so that you might know his forgiveness, which is the extension of his grace. Here's what he tells you to do. If you've never trusted Christ, you just come to him and say, I, I thank you for loving me. I thank you that you love me so much that Christ died on the cross for me. I thank you that because of that, you're willing to forgive me. And I want you to come, and I want you to dwell in my heart because I put my faith in you. What a wonderful God. What a Father. He is a good, good Father. You know why? Because that's who He is. That's who He is, and I am loved by Him. You are loved by Him. You know why? Because you're loved by the Father.